time. It didn't all just happen in one day. Um, I was attacked, well, I had intruders in my home five times over a period of, of years, not, as I said, not all in one go. And um, each time that I had an intruder, I was alone at home. And uh, the last time, as I say, as I explained to you, came very, very close for comfort. And um, yeah, I remember standing behind that bedroom door and <laughs> I was holding a pink, as I explained to you, a pink four kilogram dumbbell. Um, I'm the person that saves the ant out of the bath. I'm the person that will save the insect. So can you imagine me swatting another human being with a, you know, with a dumbbell? It just was not part of my vocabulary or my experience at all. You know, I didn't grow up in martial arts. I grew up as a ballerina. Um, I danced six days a week. Um, I didn't go to judo. I was not the girl that went to judo or karate, nothing like that. And um, yeah, uh, there I was standing behind the bedroom door wondering what to do next. And in that moment, I was having a you know, two-way conversation. Um, and part of it, I was actually saying, you know, if I make it out of this alive, I'm going to go and learn how to defend myself. And in fact, the, I, I did make it out alive. And the very next day, I made arrangements to go and learn self-defense. Okay, so in that moment, when you were, you know, going through this 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 extreme, you know, I can't even imagine what it must be like to be in that situation. And that actually passed through your through your mind at that stage. Yeah. But yeah. It was you a wish weird you, you had it, some tools to defend yourself. Yeah, you know, it's that tacky psyche syndrome where everything slows down. And in that moment. You know, I was able to kind of have this coherent conversation with myself in what must have been milliseconds, um, you know, thinking this is what I need to do. I really had absolutely no idea. Um, and I remember um, going to my first self-defense lesson. I remember walking up the stairs and um, feeling very um, vulnerable, both because I'd had the incident the day before and secondly, because when I got to the top of the stairs, I was the only female in the class, which didn't make me feel any better either. Yeah. Um, so it was a very daunting, you know, experience for me. I kind of wanted to turn tail and run straight back down the stairs, but it was too late, you know. <laughs> and uh, that's where my journey began, very hesitantly um, off a base of, of having been a victim of crime. Subsequent to that, I then, you know, as I told you, I fell in love with, with what I was doing. I found it immensely empowering. I guess there must have also been a, a synergy with the dancing. I'd, you know, danced professionally, actually. So for me, moving was a, a very natural thing to do. This was just moving in a different way. And um, so as I said to you, know, I'm, I'm just an ordinary person that, that began this journey. Maybe the only extraordinary thing about it was that um, I didn't train one or two hours a week. I trained 36 hours a week. So that was, yeah. I went into it boots and all. I'd run a high performance training center for, um, for Olympic level gymnasts and uh, dancers. So I was familiar with high performance training. So I adopted the same approach with myself and I went into it like a high performance athlete would go into something. And, and that was it. I, 36 hours a week I spent, you know, for a few years, in a, you know, year in, year out, uh, boxing, um, MMA, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, kickboxing, shooting, Krav Maga. Um, and, and that's basically where it, it all began. And the more I did it, the... The more I loved it and the more I felt I knew nothing. And in fact, here am I, I mean, today I'm a black belt and, and all of that. And the more that you travel down this road, the more you feel there is just so much more to learn. So, you know, yes. every day I'm learning from my students, I'm learning from other people. It just never stops. Can, can I ask you, did, did you go for any kind of trauma counseling or any therapy after the attack happened? I, so this, I, was, this, this was kind of your therapy? This, this was my therapy, yeah. 
And <clears throat> the interesting thing for me is that, you know, over time, having opened the club and, um, and you know, I started off with a handful of students, four or five students, and then eventually it grew up to 200 students in the club. And I can tell you from my experience of working with people, um, people come in with anger management issues. People come in with depression. People come in with post-traumatic stress um, disorder. People come in with all sorts of issues. And it just seems to provide for people an amazing outlet, an amazing uh, platform to heal from whatever it is that they are trying to heal from. And um, they forge friendships that last for years. Um, I've got students who left the club years ago because they, they immigrated or moved to another country or they uh, you know, moved to another part of South Africa and they will not leave our uh, chat group to this day. They're still part of the chat group. It, it is something that um, really has a, an enormous impact on people beyond just the obvious of you know, defending yourself. Wow, that's that's interesting. like you said earlier. It, it's it's empowering for people to yeah. to take part in that kind of training. How yeah. important as a as a as a female in this country now? How important is it to have some sort of skill in defending yourself? I think it's important for everybody, um, males and females alike. Um, I have this situation where, as you know, eighty percent of my clients are actually guys they're not women strangely enough but i have i have one of two things happen i either have a guy coming into the club um because he's he's accompanying his girlfriend and his his modus operandi is i'm going to take her and then i'm going to leave her there and she's going to live happily ever after and learn self-defense what often happens is the girlfriend leaves and he ends up staying and I've said to my students, what was it that changed for you? What caused you to, to you know, um, to continue, even though that wasn't your, your uh, objective in the beginning? And it was this, a lot of, of guys walk around feeling that, and, and this is spoken with the greatest of respect, I can only just speak from my own personal experience and what my students have told me. But there's this, this feeling of, I'm a guy, I'm big, and I can defend myself. But being big and strong counts for nothing when you have <clears throat> a nine mil at your head, you know. It's technique. It's knowing how to get out of that without getting shot. So I think in terms of people in South Africa, the, <clears throat> the male component needs to understand that strength is not what saves you at the end of the day. There's, there is so much more to self-defense. And the ladies out there have the attitude of, well, <clears throat> my husband, my boyfriend, my father, my brother, somebody's going to come to my rescue so I don't have to, you know, learn to defend myself. Generally, um, there's a, a perception that um, self-defense is something that um, is done by people that are Rambo, you know, in their camo and they, you know, <laughs> um, it's not, the perception is it's not for everybody. And my argument is, you know, I'm the average ordinary person and it has changed my life. All right, I'm doing it full time, but it is for everybody. And it doesn't matter a person's background. It doesn't matter even their fitness level when they begin. Even that doesn't matter when you when you make a start. Your, um, you know, preconceived ideas of what, what this is uh, needs to be thrown out of the window. And, and, and I think also if people start participating in um, some sort of self-defense and they join the right environment where people are supportive, where people are encouraging of one another and spurring one another on, um, the whole experience takes on a, a completely different form. After the whole story with sitting behind the bedroom door with a four kilogram dumbbell, now fast forward some years, um, I was walking in a park um, it was actually a July, the sun goes down early. It must have been about six-ish, half past six, but it was getting dark and I didn't realize I was the last person in the park. Had a big dog with me, well, she didn't help much. 
And um, I got cornered by two guys in an area where there's either a, a, a drop straight into a dam or a three-meter a, a three meter drop into a parking lot. So take your pick. You know, you, that's, that's where I was cornered. My dog ran, and, um, and there I was faced with the two guys. Um, I carry a knife. And the interesting thing was, I still had fear again, but the fear was completely different. This time I had a fear because I knew I could just see the headlines the following day, you know, Krav Maga instructor kills two people in the local park. I mean, that's all we need. Um, your, your skill level uh, goes to a different place where you have the ability to defend yourself. And what people don't realize is that with that, comes a whole nother um, dimension of, of being responsible and being cognizant of the law and, um, you know, uh, handling your, your skill in a manner that... Like a file. Exactly. 100%. Exactly the same thing. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. Also, um, an interesting thing was that um, people have joined my club Again, usually the guys will join and they will learn some skills and then the the attitude can be, well, let me pick a fight in a parking lot. I want to test drive my skills. I want to see if they work, you know. And um, it's, it's, it's actually been an interesting experience for me as a coach to watch those people start to rein themselves in when they start to realize the amount of damage they can do, the desire to go rushing off into the parking lot and pick a fight with someone starts to go away. And in fact, they, they develop a greater sense of self-control. The anger, those that have had anger issues, the anger starts to subside. It's a, it's a strange, maybe some psychologist someday will explain it to me why it works this way, but that's been the experience, you know, from my point of you. Is it specifically with guys? Yeah, um, I have found that specifically with guys. With ladies, um, it's interesting as well. I've had students arrive at the club and I say, you know, hello, welcome to the madhouse and, you know, welcome them in. And I say, what's your name? And they go, my name's... I say, pardon? My name's... And they don't actually, they, they don't even have the confidence to speak their name. Three, four months later, they're the ones who are taking new students under their wings and training them. And I'm standing going, what happened to you? You know, it's the most amazing thing to see this, you know, transpire with the ladies in the club. Um, I find the ladies um, are very, very good with weapons. Put a knife in a woman's hand and you've, you've got, you know, a formidable um, opponent if she knows how to work with it. Um, the guys tend to still like to be, um, they work well with, with weapons, but they also tend to still be, you know, fists and elbows and knees and, and that sort of thing. So that's really just been the difference. I've noticed that the women tend a lot more towards weapons, as, uh, naturally so, you know, as, a, as an equalizer. Yeah. Interesting. So, t so tell us a little bit about Storm Combat. How did, how did all this start for you? I started off training, as I said to you, my 36 hours a week, and then I started doing all my belt levels, and I went through, you know, from my yellow belt all the way through, um, eventually ended up at my black belt. But along the way, I realized that I have a passion to share this knowledge with people. So I then became trained as an instructor. And then after that, I, I ran a club for some years, and then um, it, it was round about the beginning of this year that I launched, I'd run another organization um, for some time and then at the beginning of this year I launched Storm Combat. And the idea behind Storm Combat was to intensify the system of self-defense. So I, yes, I absolutely love Krav Maga and I'm passionate about it and I teach it, but I also am passionate about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and also passionate about teaching people how to fight with a weapon. Disarming a weapon, if indeed you even disarm it, you know, if a knife's coming at you, sometimes you'll disarm it, sometimes it's better just to, you know, try and take the guy out and, and get yourself out. It's not always about, you know, going in to disarm the knife. But if you are armed and someone comes at you and you need to use your weapon, 
I'm talking specifically now here of a knife, let's just say. You need to be skilled in, in, in fighting with that knife. It's different defending a knife coming in to fighting with a knife. And so the, I decided to put together a system that would, that would incorporate the Krav Maga, intensify the defense and the grappling on the ground, not from the point of view of keeping the person on the ground. I mean, I always say to my guys, you can be, you know, executing a spectacular arm bar and the guy's buddy comes and plants a knife in your chest. You know, it's not going to help, you know, being on the ground. Get up off the ground. Get out. But right. having said that, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu does have a lot of, of really fantastic moves and, and things that we use. Having said that, um, I always say to my students, please don't go to your local JITS club and do what we've taught you because you will be disqualified and kicked off the mats because we break the rules and we eye gouge and we, we do all the things you can't do in a, you know, in a competition. So I don't teach sports Jiu-Jitsu. I teach, teach it just from the point of view of getting up, getting out. Um, and then obviously then I teach the Filipino martial arts purely more so from a knife fighting point of view than a defending point of view. Um, also, um, I have been trained in South African systems of, of knife fighting and um, I'm, I don't represent any particular organization, although I have received training and you know, I incorporate that as well. Um, but I find that the structure of the, the Filipino martial arts, I mean, it's used by your special forces, it's used, um, apparently even Spetsnaz use um, Filipino martial arts along with their system and everything else. So my argument is if it's good enough for, you know, special forces and elite military and, and elite law enforcement, you know, then it's good enough for the average civilian. So um, I put all three together and that's how Storm Combat was born. Well, it's, it's very interesting how, uh, how did you develop all of this? I mean, did you, did you go purely from a practicality point of view, um, violent crime? And how it will how it will happen to someone? Is that how did how did you approach your? Yeah, you know one of the things, Van Ant, I'm 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 very much, and my students will tell you this. I'm a stickler for things being realistic. Um, I'm a stickler for things being hardcore, and also I'm five foot two, so it's actually great being five foot two when you're teaching people because I say to my guys that are six foot two, six foot three. I'm testing this technique and don't spare the horses. Come at me with everything you've got. I want to see if this technique works because if it doesn't work, I'm not teaching it to anyone because I don't care if you're five foot two or six foot four, you always assume that your attack is bigger than you, faster than you, stronger than you, and maybe even worst case scenario, possibly in a particular area, better trained than you. Yeah. Um, you know, so you need to, to be able to defend in, in any given you know, situation. And um, my argument has always been that you cannot be doing something if it relies on strength. You can be naturally physically strong. What if you got injured? What if you've taken, you know, a bullet? What if you've taken, what if you've been stabbed and now you've lost your strength? You can't rely on strength. You need to still be able to prevail based on, you know, simple leverage technique. And also keeping things simple. The other thing is that I've also trained, um, I've, I've been involved in training um, SAPS um, and also a lot of um, CPOs and I've actually had also a couple of um, private military contractors that I've trained. And so from dealing with this, and also I've been a responder, so from dealing with this kind of thing and sometimes seeing too much on the street um, and I get there, you know, after it's happened, uh, some you know often um, you see what's going on out there and at the end of the day doing a lovely technique that looks great in the dojo doesn't go down like that in the street you know I do this with my guys I have something called corridor of death and um, I'll take 20 guys I'll put them in a in a row two rows of 10 10, 10 guys and 10 guys and I'll give them a number 1 to 20 and then I'll say to one guy, okay, you're standing at the top end of the corridor. You've got to walk through this corridor and make it home alive. I've also said to my 20 guys, you can either you can choose whatever weapon you want or you, you can be the weapon. And then as the guy's walking down, I'll say 1, 17, 5, and 8. He doesn't know who those people are, and they come at him. 
and people do the most phenomenal things under pressure. I've had students run towards a gun to disarm it. I'm going, no, you know, you don't do that sort of thing. You, you know, when you put people under massive pressure, um, people, their, their faults and the, and, and the, the, the possible, the, what's the word that I'm looking for? Perhaps the, the, the flaws in their training become immediately apparent mm. and putting people under that sort of pressure is is where it's at because it's not going to go down nicely like you see in a dojo you know everybody disarm the count the knife on the count of three you know not going to be like that so um we very uh, very realistic very um you know try and keep it keep it as real as possible the other thing that's very interesting to me is this um we'll train a student we'll train students let's say it's a gun disarm for argument's sake fantastic so they can do it brilliantly in the studio take them out into the parking lot, throw them against the, the boot of the car, you know, throw a few punches, throw a few elbows, and then put a gun in their face. Suddenly all the training's gone out the window. You know, when you, when you are putting someone in situation that's not in their comfort zone, that is where your real training, that's where the tacky hits the tarmac. Putting someone in a situation, um, walking down a, a dark corridor, and someone jumps out behind a, a concrete pillar and attacks them. You know, they're expecting it because it's part of the class. And yet, you know, all the technique can so easily fly out the window, which is why we do this over and over and over again, um, putting people under that sort of pressure to, you know, ensure that it becomes, you know, automatic. So from what I understand, it's a very intense way of training like putting people under pressure the whole time, get the adrenaline pumping. So I, that, that that would give you a real good um, indication of what you're capable of if, if you get yeah. that adrenaline pumping because that's when yeah. Yeah. that's when ego is um, out the door. Completely, yeah. But, you know, I think at Storm Combat, we're all just such a crazy bunch of people. I mean, everybody's encouraging everybody else. There's no ego. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just an amazing environment. People are, you know, socializing with each other outside of the club and they, you know, as I say, it's a really friendly environment. But, you know, I mean, sometimes I will, they'll be busy with something and um, I will put a knife in someone's hand and I'll, I'll say to them, I'm going to turn off the lights when I do go up to such and such a person and put the knife against their neck. And that person doesn't know it's going to happen. Then I turn off the lights. You cannot see your hand in front of your nose where we've been training when those lights are off. It's pitch black. And, um, you know, then it's a case of, you know, put the knife against his neck. Does he react? Does he respond? You know, can he do this with his eyes shut? Can he do this in the dark? Um, it's that sort of thing. But it sounds all terribly hardcore. A new student who joins, we don't do that to them. You know, we, we build them up slowly. We build up the confidence. We get get them to the point where they're asking for it. And sometimes students will ask to, for example, do corridor of death, and I'll say to them, um, you know, um, you can do it, but we're going to go, we're going to go lightly. I, I don't want injuries. You know, that's the thing. Um, mm -hmm. I've been on the receiving end in, in my own training. I've broken so many bones. I've lost my right eye from taking a punch in a ring. Um, so I, um, you know, can't can't see out of my right eye. Um, I only have a little bit of peripheral vision, um, and I don't want that sort of thing happening to my students. So safety, in terms of my students, is is extremely important. So when we have someone new, we we introduce them slowly and and you know build up their confidence. How how important is confidence in a combat situation? Confidence in your skills, I, I want to say. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that I always say to my students is this. There are two things that are extremely important. Obviously, your mindset. But, you know, people say mindset, mindset. Mindset can mean so many different things. So what exactly do you mean by mindset? Without going into a whole long sort of uh, thing about it, the two things that I think are important for me is this. Number one, Someone points a knife at uh, a gun at me. Someone puts puts a knife at my throat. Immediately, I'm going to psychologically want to dominate that person. So there's uh, there's this immediate 
immediate psychological uh, um, going in. Uh, you know, you can't half-heartedly defend, then you might as well not defend at all. And the other is I say to the person, initially, when you initially respond, your level of violence needs to be greater than your attackers. So um, you can't, you know, it's not Swan Lake. You can't, you know, disarm a knife in a graceful manner. You, you explode with a pulse of energy and you go for them with everything you've got. After that, once you've got the knife in your hand, then you have to decide what you're going to do with it. You know, you, you, if you go overboard and you, you, you know, seriously injure or kill a person when it's not necessary, obviously, legally, apart from morally, you know, that's a real issue as well. So, but it's that initial thing of, of getting the knife from the person or that, you know, defending yourself from a choke, being thrown on the ground, whatever it might be. So, yeah, um, I think it's those two things, uh, really, your level of violence greater than your attacker and your absolute commitment to psychologically dominating them. There's a, a lovely Israeli word, um, and maybe I'm um, explaining it wrong, or maybe someone's got a better, a better way of explaining it. But for me, I love this word, retsev. And I say to my students, retsev, retsev, and they say, what's that? And I say, forward continuous motion, do not stop until the person's not moving anymore. Just retsev, that's it. Right. And um, that's what you need to do to, you know, get in, neutralize, and, and get yourself out. So. Yes. But I, I, I like the fact that you, you're teaching it with such intensity and, and putting, putting, really putting the pressure cooker on, pe on individuals while they need to defend themselves. Yeah. So I think that's, that's, that's really, that's really gives you uh, the closest thing, I think, to a real life scenario. Because you catch them by surprise, and that's kind of that's kind of what you want to instill: is those be ready for anything. Yeah. Kind of, kind of approach. Yeah. yeah. You know, Van, I don't know if you've seen, but I mean, uh, there's so many things out there on YouTube where guys will be ripping apart self-defense instructors, saying, "You've never been in a knife fight, so how can you teach knife defense?" You've never been on the battlefield. You've never been operational in Iraq. So how can you go and teach self-defense? And my argument is this, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to be operational on the battlefield to learn a technique as long as you are keenly aware of a couple of things, all the things that can go wrong with that technique all the possible ways that your attacker could is likely to respond, the mindset of the attacker, the criminal mindset, understanding that the criminal mindset, a criminal does just not think the way you and I think. So um, it's, it's, it's getting those things into, into students to understand. And then, as I say, putting them under the maximum amount of pressure and the mistakes, the incredible mistakes that can happen when you put people in that corridor of death. Things that students would never ever dream of doing in class, they will do because, you know, and, and, and the wonderful thing is that every time we run that corridor of death, we use it as a learning opportunity. Never to break down a student and say, well, you know, you shouldn't have done this or you shouldn't have done that, but to say, here is the danger of doing what, you know, what you did here or here is the danger here's a possibly a better way of approaching it and um and also other students contributing you know it's not just me it's um having everybody else you know there the are 20 pairs of eyes there saying you know um you you gave me your back or you know you you went for the weapon you were so busy trying to disarm the knife why didn't you just take him out and run you didn't have to disarm the knife just yeah. So there's so many, you know, different permutations um, that can happen. But it, but it helps because it, it puts you in different scenarios. And from each scenario, like unlike in real life, I don't think you can learn from two situations because if you, if you didn't die the first time, it probably would have happened the second time. And this yeah. gives you a chance to have that realism, learn from it, and then yeah. hopefully that go sit somewhere in your mind when that, when that occasion comes that you that you react in the correct way. 
Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. You, you're saying, you were saying now that, you know, people criticize and say, you know, you know, you haven't been in, you haven't been in Iraq or you haven't had real combat experience, you haven't been stabbed with a knife, but the reality is we live in a war zone at the moment. Mm. And as soon yeah. as people start realizing that, then you should have a thousand students in your, in your classes. It's, you know, I think it also is something that I, I find um, is such an important message to get out to people is that don't ever think that you can't defend yourself. Don't think that, um, you know, people need to have 200 years of martial arts experience. And I've got people that are 70 years old in my club who've never done anything. And, um, but let me tell you, they're getting to the point where I don't want to go up against my own students. You know, they, they are, <laughs> um, they, they really are getting good. And um, it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your, your circumstance. There are people that live alone. There are people that live on farms. There are people that live in um, dangerous areas of, of, you know, the city. And, and the people that commute um, that are facing, you know, dangers on a regular basis. And I just believe that um, it's a negative thing just to say to people, oh, you know what, you need to forget it, you need to be military or forget it, you need to have had 20 years of experience. What we need to do is give people a message of hope and say to them, you can learn, you know, the basics, you can learn enough to, to just at least be able to try and extricate yourself from a situation. And also to know when not to fight. I say to students, once they know how to fight, I say to them, it's fantastic that you know how to fight. Now I've got to teach you when not to fight. Because knowing when not to fight is just as important. Um, you know, I say to my students, all right, so someone's got a, a gun here and they want your wallet. What's the self-defense move against that? Give them your wallet. That's the answer. You know, it's not about, oh, I know how to defend myself, bring it on, you know. It's about give them your wallet, get home safe. That's the most important thing. It's not about, you know, running around the streets like Rambo, you know. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Very well said. Ivana, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. This is a very, very interesting conversation, very different one, as I'm used to. But it's, it, was, it was of great value. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vernon. Thank you.